Welcome to this online worship service of Peace Lutheran Church. Pastor Joe Orner and I welcome you and are glad you have joined us this morning. Today we enter into the longest season of the church year, the season of Pentecost. These are Sundays on which we follow Jesus through his ministry this summer in the Gospel of Matthew. Along the way, Jesus teaches and guides us in our following him. Today we hear his call to his disciples and his call to us in our time and in our place to witness to his life-giving grace and his kingdom come for all people. And so we gather in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us bow our heads in confession. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hopes in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. We confess the sin of racism and those times when we have been silent in the face of racial injustice and fostered racial stereotypes. We sin in thought, word, and deed and we ask that by your grace you would forgive us. Through your love, renew us, and in your spirit, lead us, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Now hear God's promise of new life and forgiveness. Beloved of God, by the abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Your sins are forgiven. Live now in hope, and hope doesn't disappoint, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. God of compassion, you have opened the way for us and brought us to yourself. Pour your love into our hearts that overflowing with joy, we may freely share the blessings of your realm and faithfully proclaim the good news of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 
A reading from the 100th Psalm. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all you lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into God's presence with song. Know that the Lord is God, our maker to whom we belong. We are God's people and the sheep of God's pasture. Enter the gates of the Lord with thanksgiving and the courts with praise. Give thanks and bless God's holy name. Good indeed is the Lord, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from age to age. The Word of God for you, the people of God. Good morning again, especially all of you kids. I just want you to know how much I appreciate you. I miss seeing you. Uh, thank you for being here today. Now, in a few minutes, Pastor Joel is going to read a story about Jesus and his disciples. And I want you to listen. I want you to listen for the list, the list of Jesus' friends who are being sent out to tell about the love of God and to help other people. And what I love about this list, you'll hear, is that Judas is included. Yes, Judas is included. Maybe you remember Judas. Well, the story tells us a little detail about him. Here's Judas, the betrayer. Here's Judas, the one who messes up. Here is Judas, who lets down Jesus when things got hard. But still, Judas is sent out, along with all the other of Jesus' friends. And I read that, and I thought, wow, Judas was part of the family that Jesus sent out. And I think about my family, and, and every family has the one where you go, him too? And usually it's me. And so I wonder, I wonder what was going through Judas's mind that day. I wonder what was going through Jesus' mind that day. I wonder what was going on in the rest of the disciples' minds. I wonder about Matthew, who is writing this story of Jesus. I wonder if he stopped writing and thought, Judas was sent out there too? Well, if Jesus can use Judas, Jesus can use all of us. And that is good news. It is grace-filled news. Judas messed up. We all mess up. But I would say that if Judas is included, there is hope for all of us. Jesus loves us. Jesus loves you. And you and we are always, no matter what happens, a part of his family. I hope to see you soon. The Gospel reading comes from Matthew the ninth chapter. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into this harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First, Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew. James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector. James, son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you proclaim the good news, go and say, the kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, 
cast out demons. You receive without payment, give without payment. The word of the Lord. Grace and peace to you from God, our creator, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The last two weeks have been incredibly difficult. In the wake of George Floyd's killing, our nation has cried out for justice as systems of inequality have been exposed. I've thought to myself, how do we talk about this? And while I don't have all the answers, it becomes ever clearer, however we do it, we must not stay silent to injustice. I understand that I have a limited perspective. I am a white male in my late 20s. I had a relatively comfortable upbringing. I went to good schools, and I've never been discriminated against for the way that I look. And I realize that I'm not an expert on racism either. But I know that just like in our families, we as a church have an obligation to confront the issues of our world and to be stewards of healing. And so I've been working hard to listen and to educate myself on the pain of our black brothers and sisters, knowing that there is great work and great healing to be done. You see, I've often wondered what it would have been like to be alive during the Civil Rights Movement. I've watched plenty of movies that take place during the 1960s and the effort to desegregate schools and fight for equal rights. I've read history books throughout my educational career that taught me about the evils of slavery, lynching, and Jim Crow laws. Learning about our histories is imperative to understanding our present. But I've also had this underlying false belief that racism was defeated during the Civil Rights Movement. It's been easy to think that was then, but this is now. Things have changed. But sadly, that's not fully true. And now, once again, we have the opportunity to enact great change for the benefit of our communities, neighbors, and selves. Last week, we were incredibly fortunate to have presiding Bishop Elizabeth Eaton preach with us during worship. She reminded us in her sermon that our God is a God of relationship. And that right now, there are a multitude of relationships that need to be restored. A lot of healing that needs to happen. And in our gospel reading for today, Jesus gives us direction and how we can go about that healing and restoration. He travels proclaiming the good news. The kingdom of God has come near. He cures sicknesses and diseases. He had compassion for the harassed and the helpless. And seeing the great hurt in the world and the great need for healing, Jesus empowers his disciples to engage in that holy work. The harvest is plenty, he says, and the laborers are few. The work is necessary. The work is difficult. The struggle will be real, but the harvest is plentiful. It will be worth the effort and the hard work. And so Jesus gives them the authority to cast out unclean spirits and the power to cure diseases and sicknesses. We've talked a great deal over the last few weeks about the Holy Spirit and the Spirit's role in empowering us to participate in God's work in the world. That's evident here in this passage as well. As Jesus invites the disciples into his mission of bringing the kingdom of God, the love of heaven, to earth. And this is an invitation for us as well. Because right now we are fighting two powerful and deadly diseases. We are battling both the coronavirus and we're also battling racism. As we wonder together, what can we do to end this disease? What can we do to stop racism? What can we do to promote justice and equity in our communities? I want to propose three things that we can all do to create a better world for ourselves and for our neighbors. There are no simple solutions to complex problems, generational problems that have existed for hundreds of years. But knowing that the ELCA is the whitest Christian denomination in the United States, and speaking especially to those of you who are white today, I believe that this is a start. The first thing that we can do is to acknowledge that there is a problem. As I mentioned earlier, it's easy to think that 
Racism is something that we dealt with in the past, but it's not an issue now. To think that there isn't slavery anymore, there isn't segregation anymore, so there must not, there must not be a problem anymore. That's a falsehood. We have a problem, a disease, and as the church, we must be on the front lines of its healing. Think about the problems you might have in your family. Parents and partners, when you have an issue in your house, maybe your words or actions hurt your spouse, or maybe one of the kids hurts another. When that happens, we don't ignore the issue. We confront it, we talk about it, we apologize, and we put in the work to heal those wounds. Similarly, if you have a broken arm or a broken leg, you don't ignore it. You don't keep walking on it, otherwise the break will get worse. The damage becomes greater. It becomes harder to heal. As the family of God, the same is true for us. We are one body of Christ, all children of God, all the sheep of God's pasture. All beloved, made in diversity, made in God's image. When our family hurts, when one part of our body hurts, we all hurt, and then we help each other heal. The first thing we do is address the problem. A second thing we can do is exercise empathy. The ability to understand and share the feelings of someone else. Jesus enacts this for us in our gospel passage. The Gospel writer states, He had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless. Jesus has compassion. He listens, he hears, and develops understanding for the pain and grief of the people he interacts with. These last couple weeks, I've been hearing countless stories of those who have been affected by systematic and systemic racism. One friend described stepping out of his home to see what was going on as multiple squad cars came down the block. After being told there might be a burglar nearby and fearing for the safety of his family, he turned to go back inside his house. But as he did so, he was ordered to, to freeze and lie down on his pavement of his own driveway as his wife got his ID, all because of the color of his skin, which fit the description of the person they believed they were looking for. Another whose parents were trying to find a house but were denied a loan because of suspicions they wouldn't be able to pay it back, despite both parents having well-qualified jobs. Another who described growing up in a mostly white community and wondering why there weren't more people who looked like her in her neighborhood, only to realize that the neighborhoods were redlined to keep specific groups of people out. Consider the building of Highways in the Twin Cities as well. 35W and Highway 94 were both built through neighborhoods in order to physically segregate white neighborhoods from black neighborhoods. The effects of this are still seen today. And these aren't isolated events. They're examples of systemic racism. And our country, unfortunately, is full of them. The Bible expresses how we might follow the example of God when practicing empathy. The Israelites viewed God as being one who was up there and who was distant while they were down here alone. And so God came to us in the form of Jesus, fully God and fully human, and experienced joy as we feel joy, experienced suffering as we feel suffering. Jesus is the embodiment of God's empathy for us. And the Apostle Paul also teaches us how to practice empathy in the book of Romans. He says we rejoice with those who rejoice. We mourn with those who mourn. And so we go and do likewise. We have empathy. And the third thing we can do is radically love and serve others. Theologian and professor Dr. Cornell West says, The country's in deep trouble. We've forgotten that a rich life consists fundamentally of serving others, trying to leave the world a little better than you found it. We need the courage to question the powers that be, the courage to be impatient with evil and patient with people, the courage to fight for social justice. 
In many instances, we will be stepping out on nothing and just hoping to land on something. But that's the struggle. To live is to wrestle with despair, yet never allow despair to have the last word. We live in a world with despair, with racism, with injustice, with inequality. But we do not let those things win or have the last word. And so we sit with our neighbors who are grieving. We stand alongside our neighbors who cry for justice. We use our voices to raise up those whose voices have been diminished. We use our hands to help in the act of healing. We use our time and our resources to care for those in need of support. We love, we serve, we pray, we act. I keep thinking back to this beautiful moment when Pastor Mark and I attended a clergy march together about a week and a half ago. All of us, faith leaders from all backgrounds, knelt down in holy unison and prayed the Lord's Prayer together. It felt like we were on sacred ground as we prayed, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And as we continue in our prayers, in our actions, may we not forget the importance of the words, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. May we ask ourselves what that would look like compared to our current state. And ask how we can be a part of that needed change. May we be the stewards of God's justice and mercy as we bring God's divine heavenly love to all people here on earth. May we listen, practice deep care, compassion, and empathy for our neighbors, especially our black neighbors. May we be bringers of abundant life. May we follow Christ's lead as we listen, learn, and we respond. As we acknowledge the problems, exercise empathy, and love radically. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I will not bow down to racism. I will not bow down to injustice. I will not give in to exploitation. We will stand. We will
Today we will pray by petition. I will conclude the petition with, Hear us, O God, and I invite you to respond, Your mercy is great. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. Gracious God, you speak to us of forgiveness, of freedom, of justice, the resurrection, and transformation. Open us to your new world of justice and peace and liberty for all that is coming soon, even now. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Holy God, we have created divisions that you will not own. In places of conflict, raise up leaders who work to develop lasting peace and reconciliation. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Healing God, you care for those who are harassed and helpless. Protect and defend those who are abused. Heal those who are sick. Inspire and guide those who work to guard us from the pandemic and strengthen medical people in their life-sustaining tasks. Feed all who hunger and empower all whose voices go unheard and help us to respond to the pressing needs of our neighbors. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Lord, you call us to make your presence known. Accompany people of faith as they nurture relationships in new ways. Where the sin of racism fractures our relationships, bring repentance and reconciliation and humility. Hear us, O oh God, your mercy is great. Lord Jesus, it wasn't our idea to follow you. It was your idea that we should come follow you and be your disciples. We worship you today because you have summoned us, enlisted us to work with you. And Lord, this work to which you have called us is far too great for us. We get overwhelmed, we can't cope, we lose heart, and we tire out. Empower us then, we pray, with your life-giving spirit in these days ahead. Strengthen our wills and give us what we need to be faithful in the work to which you have called us. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Receive these prayers, O God, and those too deep for words. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, amen. Let us pray together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And so may God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter bless you and keep you in eternal love. Amen. Thank you.